today on Facing Life Head On. How would you react if your doctor told you you were going to have six children all at the same time? That's what happened to Keith and Jennifer Hanselman. After the shock wore off, they were faced with a critical decision. Stick around for the answer and the impact it had on their family. Our cameras took us to Northern Ohio, where we met Keith and Jennifer Hanselman. Keith, a chemist, and Jennifer, an advertising writer, welcomed home their first baby, Connor, a few years after they were married. Then, two years later, through the help of fertility treatments, their little family was about to get a little bigger. After the birth of your son, Connor, uh, you knew you wanted more children, but six? <laughs> that was kind of a shock, yes. <laughs> it's not the goal. No. We were hoping for one more. We were wanting two children, and because we decided that any time that the kids outnumber the parents is a bad thing, and trust me, we still think that most yeah. days. <laughs> but um, we just we went with what God gave us. So, what went through your minds when you found out the news? A lot of stuff unfit for network television. <laughs> My first thought was that I'm going to be a headline. I don't think I want to be a headline, but he was very reassuring and trying to tell me that things were going to be okay. He said, "I'm not sure how, but it's going to be okay." So. You know, we tried to pull ourselves together as best as we could, but it was definitely a shock. I suppose one of your first concerns was for the health of those children. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I was in school. I took an embryology class, and it wasn't a very rosy picture that the doctors or, you know, my knowledge was painting for me that, you know, this just isn't normal and not doesn't have a very happy ending. Our chances of that are very slim. And the doctor gave us a big fat stack of information. He said, really, there's no way that you can carry sex tablets even if you want to. And he gave us lots of statistics of all the terrible birth defects and bad outcomes that could happen if we tried to carry that many. And, you know, there was a lot of things that would put my health at risk, too, and there was a good chance that I would not make it as well. So your doctor suggested selective reduction. Yes. Yes. That was, that was the only option that he really gave us was selective reduction. He wanted us to go and speak to a doctor who did that procedure and he explained that, you know, they go in with the ultrasound and put an, a needle full of poison in the baby's heart and basically you pick which ones and then you watch and you can see on the ultrasound when they stop, when their heart stops beating. And immediately my thought was, I can't do that. I can't live with that choice the rest of my life. Selective reduction is aborting babies down to whatever number you yes. choose to have yes. them. Yes, <laughs> and they recommended that we reduce to either twins or at most triplets to give the rest of the babies the best chance. And scientifically, that is the best thing to do, but well, in our hearts, morally, we knew we couldn't do that. Yeah. There was a, a line from Star Wars that um, I remember as soon as the doctor told me that one was... Um, once you start down the trail to the dark side, forever will it dominate your destiny. And it, it was something that stuck with me the whole, the whole pregnancy, you know. It was like, I can't do this. This is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So what kind of pressure were you under to abort some of your children? Very great pressure. Every, every checkup we went back, the doctor wanted us to change our mind. He was very angry when we told him our decision not to reduce the pregnancy. And we had until 12 weeks to make that decision, and beyond that, it was, it was too risky. And so every time, you know, the closer it got to 12 weeks, he was pushing and pushing and pushing. And, and finally, we got to the last ultrasound, and he said, well, I see lumps on the necks of two of the babies, which more than likely means Down syndrome. You really need to at least get rid of those two because you can't care for two special needs children and four regular abled children. He said, it's just not possible. You really need to go ahead with this procedure. And we still stuck to our guns and prayed a lot and decided to keep going no matter what. Well, at some point in the pregnancy, then, you switched from the fertility doctor to Dr. Lavin, right? Yes. yes. We went to the fertility doctor up until 12 weeks, and after that, he recommended us to Dr. Lavin, and we were very pleasantly surprised to find that Dr. Lavin was so incredibly supportive. And the first thing he said was, I'll help you get the best results possible. Whatever your decision is, I will help you do as much as possible for these kids to make sure that we have a good outcome. And he was so supportive the whole way through. I really could not say enough good things about what an excellent doctor he was. 
We headed to Akron General Medical Center where we met Dr. Lavin. Though Dr. Lavin specializes in high-risk pregnancies, working with the sextuplets was new territory. Well, you know, there's only been seven sec sets of se sextuplets born in the United States, so we had to um, spend a little time uh, trying to figure out how to deal with this, and uh, it was really exciting. We put a lot of time planning how we would manage this and try to get the babies born in a nice, safe environment, and it worked out very well. Some of Jennifer's doctors suggested selective reduction. What was your advice to her? Well, I told her that it was her decision. I explained to her the, the risks of carrying all the, all the babies, and I also explained to her the, the risks of doing that procedure. Uh, that procedure has been associated with the lower, lower rates of premature birth and actually with more surviving infants, with a higher chance of going home with a live infant. But I left the choice to her, which I think is the most appropriate thing. One Sunday, uh, Keith and Jennifer came and announced that, they, that she was pregnant and there was a normal pregnancy as far as I knew. A couple weeks later they came back and announced that it turned out they believed that they had six children uh, there and that was the announcement they made in the church where they confided to me that the doctors were asking them to reduce the number from six to at least three and probably down to two to be safe and they wanted to discuss what, which way they should go with it and uh, so I said okay fine we can talk about it and, you know, let me know when we get together we'll discuss it. Well, in the meantime, they kind of made their own decision. The next week, they came back and told me, well, we've made our decision. There's no need to discuss anything anymore. Uh, we decided we're going to keep all six, and that's the way it's going to be, and uh, that, that's fine with me. So our job then was to support them in their, in their decision. In my heart, I knew I couldn't live with myself. I would always look at the kids that were left and think, what would the ones that we had reduced, what would they have become? You know, what chance would they have been to be a great person? You know, and I just didn't feel that I could play God in that way and decide which ones to get rid of. When I heard that she was having six kids, you know, I immediately said a prayer for her and thought how strong she has to be. And what I still admire about her to this day is how strong her faith is. And she put her total life and the baby's life in God's hand. As the pregnancy continued, what risks did you face, Jennifer? Oh boy, my entire body faced the whole risk of just shutting down entirely from the stress because um, the babies were just taking so much from me and they took all the calories and all the nutrients and everything I ate pretty much went right to them. And so there was all kinds of risks. They monitored my blood pressure and my heart rate and my temperature and all this stuff all day long when I was in the hospital to make sure that my body was still functioning as it should because in a lot of women who go through such high risk pregnancies at the end their body just starts shutting down and their systems start shutting down and I was very fortunate that none of that happened to me and I was really just uncomfortable the whole time not so much in danger but um, there were a long list of very serious things that could happen to me for the entire pregnancy and really I just tried not to focus on that and tried to focus on being strong and eating as much as I could to fuel the baby's growth. How risky is it for a woman to have six children all at once? The most common problem is that they uh, are born prematurely. In fact, every baby you have more than one, on the average, the babies come about three and a half weeks early. So that'd be the most common problem. But also there are other uh, problems. Uh, multiples have a higher rate of uh, congenital abnormalities. It's about twice the normal rate. And they have sometimes problems with um, having too much amniotic fluid or too little amniotic fluid. Uh, and sometimes um, problems with growing slowly because, um, uh, for lack of a better word, women have sort of evolved to support one baby and sometimes we have to get all those placentas in there, there's just not enough room for the blood supply or the roots to grow in. So some of the babies don't get as much nutrition. I think those are probably the main problems. When we return, the Hanselmans talk about what happened next and they said, you know, these babies are going to pop somewhere unless we do something soon. Earlier, we met Keith and Jennifer Hanselman. Pregnant with sex tuplets, the couple was advised to selectively abort at least half of the babies, giving the others and Jennifer a higher chance of survival. But Keith and Jennifer stood strong and continued the high-risk pregnancy. Did either of you worry that the babies would have health issues once they were born? Yes. Yeah. 
that was one of our major concerns because we read too much and then we knew too much and knew all the things that could happen and all the things there were to worry about but we had so many ultrasounds and every ultrasound we had the babies came back looking bigger stronger healthier you know doing what they were supposed to do we did have a few hiccups like the bump on the neck that turned out to be nothing at 12 weeks but in general every ultrasound gave us a better and better picture of the babies 23 weeks into the pregnancy you were admitted to the hospital and put on bed rest mm -hmm. How long was it then that, till the babies actually were born? It was five and a half weeks from the time I was admitted. Um, I came in in labor that day and they worked very frantically to try to get the right mix of drugs to stop the contractions because it was way too early. The minimum that they were that they needed to reach was 24 weeks and really even that was much too soon. The doctor was shooting for 28 weeks and we eventually achieved that 28 and a half weeks and um, every day was precious really. The first three days they really were trying to just keep the contractions under control and get the right drugs and finally they did and I was moved off labor and delivery and into the perinatal floor where I sat and waited for another five weeks until it was finally time. But I had been on bed rest at home from 15 weeks to 23 weeks so it was a lot of sitting around and trying just to be patient which was very hard for me. <laughs> Well, tell me about the day that your babies were born. Oh, well, I'd been having contractions for about a week off and on, and finally that morning they had done an ultrasound on my old C-section scar from Connor the day before, and they said, that's really thinning out, that's in, in danger of rupturing, and they checked my cervix, and that was getting pretty thin too, and they said, you know, these babies are going to pop somewhere unless we do something soon. So at 7.30 they came in that day and checked me again and said, today's the day. And so I called Keith, and I think he set a new land speed record coming from his work <laughs> to the hospital. I uh, wasn't expecting a phone call at all. I had just gotten to work, and uh, I talked with, I uh, visited Jen the night before, and she had told me a Dr. Lavin was hoping to go to 30 weeks, and she was very upset about that. Just that she was, she was pretty tired of being that pregnant, and she was already at um, 48 weeks in size. They had the little belly tapes and they had to start using two on her and that really upset her. And, uh, you know, I told my friends it was, uh, it was time and uh, I was on my way and I was shaking a little bit and I got down to the hospital in a hurry and by the time I got to the hospital, Jay were getting everything ready for the babies and it, they had um, a set of doctors and nurses for Jen, for the babies, they had a backup set in case there was a problem, and I'm pretty sure they had a set for me too in case I fainted or anything. <laughs> well, I was the primary surgeon. We needed, I think, about five surgeons to do the case because we had to move quickly. The whole procedure probably took about an hour, but it actually only took about a minute to deliver the babies once we started with the first one. They just swung into action. Everything was very practiced and methodical and unhurried. They had rehearsed this delivery so many times, and they had everyone on standby and all the equipment ready and everybody was just very calm about it and it was a well-oiled machine and they just boom, 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 down the checklist they went and at 9.42 all the kids were born in the same minute. It wasn't no time at all before uh, I was a father of seven kids. The babies uh, weighed from a, roughly about um, a little over 700 grams to about 1,200 grams which is a little less than two pounds to about three pounds and so obviously babies that size um, I were worry, but over the next week or so they improved dramatically and then we began to be pretty hopeful that things would turn out just fine. When we return, the Hanselman babies come home. We were kind of worried we wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Thank you for inviting us into your home. Each week we feature real people who deal with real life issues head on. Some of their experiences are uplifting, while others will break your heart. But in the end, the message is clear. Those who follow biblical principles on the issues of life are blessed. Become a partner with us in providing a positive, life-affirming message to help change the way the next generation values innocent human life. Please consider a generous gift to help offset the costs of producing this important quality programming. You can donate on our secure website at facinglife.tv or by calling the phone number on your screen during normal business hours. Together, we can make a real difference for life. Whether you're a student needing answers, a parent needing help, or a concerned citizen wanting to make a difference, Life Issues Institute has the resources you need to put your values into action. 
Life Issues Institute is an international educational organization committed to protecting innocent human life. Life Issues Institute knows what it takes. That's why millions throughout the world turn here for help. Life Issues Institute has authored more pro-life publications than any other entity in the world. And its materials are printed in over 30 languages. Radio broadcasts, newsletters, and a website filled to the brim with the answers you're looking for are just a click away. Go to FacingLife.tv and click on the link to Life Issues Institute to find out more about how you can change the heart of a nation. Keith and Jennifer Hanselman's sex tuplets made history. The first to be born in Ohio and the first in the nation to be completely healthy. They were headed home just weeks after birth. We did a lot of planning on this. We had met for months to plan how to have everybody available to care for the babies. And that just went off seamlessly. So you brought, within a matter of weeks, short weeks, six preemie babies into your home. Yes. yes. What was that like for you? It was a blur. It was a big blur. The kids came home one at a time over the course of three weeks, so we got a chance to get to know each one. We were kind of worried we wouldn't be able to tell them apart because they had no fat when they were that little. They had absolutely no fat, and so they all looked a lot alike. But um, just bringing them home one at a time gave us a chance to sort of get to know them and get acquainted with their little quirks and things like that. When did you start to see their personalities come out? I would say at birth. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely at birth. You. Yeah, Sophie was our, our smallest, and you could definitely tell she was a fighter and was not going to take um, no from anyone, and you know, whatever she wanted, she was going to get, and she's, she still kept that personality. Isabella was our firstborn, and she was a diva then, and she's a diva now. She definitely wants the attention on her, and Lucy was always very quiet, and she's still quiet, but she's gotten to be more of the, the mother hen of the pack. Then there's Kyle, the snuggler, Logan, the flirt, and Alex, the future engineer. How did you manage just to get through it? Everything was assembly line. We had a process for everything. There was a plan for everything and a chart for everything and a list for everything. We just did the same thing in routine over and over and over until even when you're completely tired and about to fall asleep on your feet, you just did it by instinct. And you would be amazed what you can do when you have to, but I'm glad we don't have to do it over again because yeah. that first year was just killer. Ooh. Well, you had a significant number of people who came into the house to help, right? Yes, we had over 75 people on our volunteer roster when we were at